Hello, everybody. You good? Hey, Christmas is happening. It is on, everyone. There's no going back now. One more week. I know, right? Uh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Nadia and to Vika and Lydia for the Christmas decorations they put up here on the windows. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> And uh, I want to know from you, as we get started with the message for today, I want to know from you, what is your favorite thing about Christmas time? Would you just shout it out where you are? Oh, Jesus, oh, there's, always one. <laughs> there's always one who's trying to be deep, you know, it's like, oh, Jesus, yeah, okay. Anything else apart from <laughs> the reason for the season, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, one after the other. What is it? Christmas markets, yes, yeah, because you leave broke. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what else? What else? Any, anything over here? Turkey? Huh? No, what? what wait a minute. What, what did you say? Cookies. I was like, turkey, what? Cookies are amazing. Yes, yes. And what did you say? I don't even, what? Schnee, snow, snow. Yeah, well, there's no snow. It's gone, man. It's like, it's gone. Well, what did you say? So, Free food. Free food. I like free food. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> That's good. What else over here? What else over here? All the giveaways. All the giveaways. The presents and everything. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. Anything you guys, what, what, what do you like about Christmas over here? Nothing? He's just like, no. Home Alone. Yes, movies, right? Can we just have a vote on like uh, favorite Christmas movies? Just all shout it out at once. Die Hard, exactly, Die Hard, it is, yes, I heard it, I heard it right. <laughs> Harry Potter, okay, is that your favorite thing about Christmas time, or just, oh, still movies, okay, yeah. <laughs> what else, what do you like about, anything else that you like about Christmas? Family dinners, so good, yes, what else? Sorry? Being cozy, having a cup of tea, and snowing out, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael Bublé singing and all of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's, let's bring balance to the room. Let's bring balance to the room. What is the hardest thing about Christmas time? Let, let's just get real, guys. What is, the hard, what is the worst thing about this time of the year? Expectations. Expectations. Just making sure everyone is happy. And yes, it's, I knew a woman would say that. Women just have a bit more stressful time. Like, I, I never know. Mothers have a more stressful time, yeah, yeah. I don't really know what that is about, but I'm just, I'm just playing. Don't, don't start texting Jenny. It's like, your husband is horrible. Like, you know, <laughs> okay. No, it is, it is true. Like, there's a lot of expectations for kids, for all of us. Like, we have to have fun. Guys. You know, it's true. What, what else? What is hard about this season? Ex expenses, yeah, because everything's going up. And, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I have to buy gifts <laughs> for people you don't even like with money you don't have, and, you know. <laughs> What else? Anything else that you don't like about this season? Ah, oh, yes. That's, that's rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you have? Empty seats at dinner table. Mm. You hear that? Empty seats at the dinner table. Can we just get real? This is, this is hard. Uh, when, when there's someone that is maybe far away or is no longer with us, and there's an empty seat at the table, which is also a nice thing to do to honor the person, but there's grief that feels heavier at this time of the year, isn't it? Anything else that you think, oh, that's really hard this time of the year? Being, yeah. Being far away from home sickness is just really, really painful this time of the year. And I know some, some of us are traveling, maybe watching the live stream, but some of us are here and you feel a bit stuck here in, in Berlin, maybe when your family and friends are all somewhere else. That's, that's a real thing. Loneliness is huge around Christmas. Uh, anything else that is hard about this season? Yes, when people don't know the real message of Christmas, like, guys, you are celebrating, but you don't even know why. That's, that's rough, yeah. That's why God placed us here, so we can remind them and tell them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Sorry? No, there was someone else. Just <laughs> um, can, we, can we just acknowledge this, that uh, Christmas time, this, this season, there is the joy of Christmas, and there's also just kind of a bit of melancholy. Like, there's just, just a, like, how does a weary soul rejoice? You know that from that Christmas song we sometimes sing, Oh, Holy Night, there's a weary world rejoices. How, how does that happen? How do we rejoice? There's a lot of people here today who are joyful. There's also quite a number of us here today. Look, deep down, you're quite weary, and you're finding the season a bit harder than you'd like to admit. Um, we're in a series... We call Tunes of Hope, 
And every Sunday in, in Advent, we want to look at a different Christmas carol and just go a little bit deeper. It's like, what is it we're singing about here? And today, we're going to look at the song we were just singing, Joy to the World. And I want to ask this question today, like, well, how are we finding joy in the midst of also some of the hard stuff? There's a lot of things that make us happy. We've mentioned them. There's also some stuff that's really hard. How do we find joy? Um, this song, Joy to the World, I'm going to read the lyrics in a moment, was written uh, by a man named Isaac Watts. Who has ever heard of Isaac Watts? No? Some of you have. Come on. Yeah, Isaac Watts, yeah. He was a pastor in the 17th and 18th century in Southampton in England. And uh, he has been given afterwards a great title. He is the father of English hymnology, like the father of Christian song in Britain. That's, that's quite a cool title. He, he really was a pioneer when it comes to songwriting around churches because up until that time, I don't know if you knew this, up until that time in the churches in Britain, they were only exclusively singing the Psalms from the Old Testament, the Psalms of David in their worship services on Sundays. That was all they were singing. And after a while, it just got a bit repetitive. After a while, it became a bit of a routine. It became a bit predictable. And people were sitting in church, and they were just going through the motions. And young Isaac, well, here he is in um, Westminster Abbey. You can see that's what he looked like, apparently. But um, uh, young Isaac Watts, apparently, he was quite troubled with that fact. There is there's a quote, I, I can't, I'm paraphrasing it now, where he says, like, when I look at the faces, the bored faces of the congregation while they have the Psalms on their lips, I'm disgusted by it, he said. And uh, he said, to an outsider, it, it's, all, it's so boring that they start to question the sincerity of their spirituality, the sincerity of their spirituality. I hope that can never be said of us, guys. I, I hope we will always have a joyful expression on our face when we sing praises to King Jesus. Amen? Um, but back then, apparently, that was, a, that was a big thing. And he started to complain. He became a bit of a cynic, possibly, about like, oh, the Christians, they got it all wrong and whatever, to the point that his own dad, um, who got a bit tired of all the whining, <laughs> he said to his son, go on then, write some better songs then. And he said, uh, maybe I should. By the way, there's a great principle in here, uh, leadership principle. Leadership, like leadership is not about complaining what is, you're, you're creating what could be, okay? A lot of us were very good at complaining. We need to stop complaining and start creating. It's true in church as well, by the way. Here's a, a new, new Year's resolution already for you. In the new year, I won't complain, I will create, okay? Anyways, so the father said, go on, write some better songs. Then the son says, maybe I should. And he started to write new songs. And he was like, immediately, he got a lot of opposition. There were lots of critics around him who uh, basically said, hey, Isaac, do you think you are better than King David? who wrote the Psalms. You think you can write better stuff than King David? Come on, David is quite important. Like, you think you're better than him? And Isaac Watts responded, I'm not better than King David, but I know some stuff that he didn't. I know the New Testament. <laughs> I know about Jesus. And he said, aren't you curious? Don't you ever wonder how David might have written the Psalms if he would have known about Jesus? And so that's, he was kind of on this quest Isaac Watts was on this quest. It's like, okay, how do we bring a bit more Jesus to our worship? Uh, because it's all Old Testament stuff. And so he started to basically rewrite or interpret, paraphrase some of the Psalms of David and think about, like, well, how would we sing this if we would know about Jesus? And in the year 1719, he published a book that is basically, it's, it, it's uh, written, this, hymn, this hymnal is written, The Psalms of David in the Language of the New Testament. The Psalms of David in the language of the New Testament. One of the Psalms he reinterpreted or he rewrote, he paraphrased, was Psalm 98 where it says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Maybe you know that Psalm. Now let's look at the lyrics of how he rewrote that Psalm 98. He said, Joy to the world. Why? The Lord has come. Here's a reason that David didn't know about. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare. Let's sing it together again. Come on, you're just looking at me again like you're in church with Isaac Watts. Come on. <laughs> Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us receive the king. That's right. Let every 
heart, prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and Very good. <laughs> Joy is a theme in the Christmas story. You figured this out already, right? You know, when the angel came to the shepherds, what does he say? He said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great Joy, right? Come on, this is the joy is all over the Christmas story. Uh, Christmas is a festival, not a funeral. And Advent is the time of preparation leading up to the festival, leading up to the celebration, to Christmas. Advent is a time of anticipation. We have a great word in German that is not existing in English. It's the word Vorfreude, the pre-joy. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, we're, we're about to have some joy and there's anticipation, I guess, is the translation for it. Vorfreude. Vorfreude. Have you heard this before? Yeah, some of you have, obviously. Vorfreude. Vorfreude is what you feel when you've ordered the pizza on the phone, you just hung up and you know in 20 minutes there's going to be a pizza. That's Vorfreude. You're not enjoying it quite yet, but you know it's coming. Vorfreude is when you hear the orchestra tuning their strings. It doesn't even sound that nice yet, but it's like, oh, something great is about to happen, a symphony. Vorfreude is when you pack your bags and you're about to go maybe visit your family for Christmas. Some of you are going to do that this week. That's Vorfreude. Vorfreude, guys, is when you hear the Champions League hymn and you're, you're just like, the champions. You know, that happens like, oh, we're about to, have, we're about to see a good game here. Right, that's Vorfreude. And, 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 and we find this, I believe, that is the vibe of Luke chapter 1. It's all about Vorfreude. Luke chapter 2 is where Jesus is born. That's the celebration. Luke chapter 1 is the preparation time beforehand, uh, where, where there's a lot of joy, a lot of anticipation. Your heart is starting to race faster. You can't wait. You know you're on the brink of something beautiful to happen. Let me read to you uh, some of the verses. We don't have time to read the whole chapter, but there's some things here that I believe are going to help us today. Starting in verse 26, if you have your message notes on your piece of paper, you can read along there or on the screen. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, we're going to get in a moment to who Elizabeth is. Here's what happened. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Let's pause right here. She did not used to think of herself that way as the angel had addressed her. Favored woman? Who are you talking about? What are you talking about? She was an ordinary peasant girl, possibly living in a mud brick house in a place called Nazareth, which was a bit of a rough place. Uh, she was a young person, which means in that society was, she was rather insignificant. She was a female, which means she wasn't important. She was often overlooked. She was rather poor, probably. There's a lot of scholars, some scholars who believe she wasn't even very good looking. She was probably not, not, not one that you're like, oh, she's cute or whatever. No, not with Mary. She was quite um, overlooked. But the angel comes, greetings, favored woman. And she must have thought like, who, who are you talking about? <laughs> Who are you talking to? You can't mean me. You're, you're talking to me in a way that nobody ever talks to me. I'm, I'm confused by the introduction here alone. What, 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 what are you talking about, favorite woman? Are you sure you got the right person? I think you got the wrong address. And I love this about God is that he likes to place his favor, favorite woman, he likes to place his favor on, on people um, on ordinary people to do extraordinary things. He likes to choose the outsider to do something outstanding. Like in the Bible, you find this over and over again, that God uh, continuously, persistently, and exclusively places his favor on people who never deserved it, who didn't even ask for it, and in most cases don't even appreciate it fully when they received it. Mary had every right, you would think, because of her, who she was. Every, you, you would think, you know, she, she could have just dismissed the angel. It's like, sorry, I'm not interested. You got the wrong person. But I think the angel, he, he knew why she was looking. So it says she was confused and disturbed. And so the angel says this in verse 30 on the screen. Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found 
favor with God. It's true. You are favored by God. You will conceive, he says, and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. I mean, guys, if, if the Lord comes to you and describes your future child to you that way, like, oh, that's, that sounds about all right. He will be a king. He will be great. His rule will have no end. Come on. Yes, that sounds very encouraging. But Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm still a virgin. To which the angel replied, oh, you are? Wait, let me go back to God. Double check. <laughs> it's not what the angel said, did he? It's not like he said, let me go back to God. It's like, God, did you know she's still a virgin? Like, come on. Have you thought about, how, should we not go see somebody else about this? Like, she can't have a baby. She's still a virgin. Like, that's, that's not what he says. He, he knew this question was there. And so he's, he gives her the response. He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and will be called the Son of God. The angel here, he comes to Mary. And what he does is he totally turns her life upside down. This is a complete disruption to everything she had been going on in her life. And suddenly things get very complicated. Sure, Jesus eventually, he was going to be a blessing. But when Jesus arrived... Jesus wasn't a blessing. He was a, a burden more. He immediately caused some, some worries. Like, all the questions, just think this through, what Mary must have thought about. Like, oh, how am I going to tell Joseph? Like, hey, <laughs> I'm pregnant, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's like, she must have thought, like, he's going to leave me. I'm going to be by myself. How am I going to my tell, tell my family? They're not going to believe me. Maybe they will even kick me out of the family unit. Maybe I will be a single mother with no support. That means I will live the rest of my life with this child in poverty. What will the neighbors say? What will the village say? What about my reputation? My whole honor is ruined. When Jesus arrived, he immediately became a burden for Mary. Make sense? And yet what we see, and I think this is amazing, this is crazy. In chapter one, Mary seems to be bursting with joy, with forfreude, with anticipation. That should not make sense. For most of us, most of our happiness is like... Um, is like a boat in, when, when, in, when the tide comes. You know, like when the, when the water goes up, the boat goes up. When the water goes down, the boat goes down. That's how oftentimes it is with our happiness in life. Like when life is good, we feel good. When life goes bad, we feel bad. Makes sense. With Mary, just catch this, guys. This is significant. Mary's life is going from okay to crazy complicated, and yet her happiness and her joy is going up. That should not make sense. I want to learn from her. What is her secret? What can we learn from Mary about finding joy in the middle of chaos, in the middle of heartbreak? If you want to write some things down, I think, I hope they would be helpful. The first one we can learn from her is, number one, joy is rooted in surrender. Joy is rooted in surrender. You know, some of you may not like this, but this is what we can see in Mary's life. Here's how she responds in verse 38, how she responds to what the angel said. She says to him, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. What is she doing? She's putting her yes on the table. Like, okay, Lord, yes. I say yes. I surrender. She had her whole life planned out. And now everything was being disrupted, interrupted, and turned upside down. And she was let, willing to let go of her plans and say yes Okay, may it be done so. Sometimes the thing that um, prevents us from experiencing joy is our unwillingness to let go of our own plans. Let me say that again. Sometimes the thing that prevents us from experiencing the joy, the joy of the Lord, is our unwillingness to let go of our own plans. Obviously, because it's so uncomfortable to do, to do that, that we want to be in control of things. Some of you, you are standing on the sidelines of the joy that God has for you, that he has prepared for you. But you're standing on the sidelines of it because um, the thing that he's leading you to, you're not sure about. You, you feel uncomfortable about it or it doesn't make sense to you. Listen, if you only obey God when it feels right to you or when you, when you agree with it, then it's not surrender, then it's agreement. 
You're just agreeing with God. Like, God, good idea. I agree. I would have done the same thing. Let's go. You know, surrender means, Lord, I trust you. And, and, and you don't even owe me an explanation. It doesn't make sense to me right now. But I believe you're good. You want the best for, you want the best, you want what's best for me. And, and so I'm going to trust you. Even if I'd rather not. Even if it doesn't make sense. Even if it's really embarrassing. What we can see in Mary's life is that joy comes from surrender. Joy comes from saying yes to God. I've been in Berlin now for 11 years. One of the questions that I often come across when I talk to people about the Christian faith, and they're curious about it, and they're maybe even considering becoming a Christian. One of the questions that comes up, and I'm sure many of us have asked it as well, is if I become a Christian, will God still allow me to do this or that? Have you asked this? If I become a Christian, can I still do this? Can I still do that? Because I don't want to become a Christian if I'm not allowed to still do this or to that. Have you asked? Just be honest. How many of you have thought this? Come on, yeah? In some level of form. We, we thought this question, and, and what we're trying to do, and what, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to get God to surrender to us rather than we're su submitting to him. We're trying to get him to obey us. And I was like, yes, I want God in my life. It makes sense in many ways. Like, he seems to be really helpful, and I want him to provide for me. I want him to advise me. I want him to help me. I want him to forgive me, all of that, but I still want to be in control. I still, I don't want to give up control. I still want to say what's best for me because I know what's best for me. How do I know it? if God knows what's best for me? If I surrender to him, what if I miss out on all the fun stuff? What if I miss out? What if I lose when I surrender? You know, that's, that's a picture that we have of God. But, you know, even in the song, Joy to the World, like he rules the world. Doesn't that say, what does it say? I didn't write it down. He rules the world with truth and grace, not with violence and tyranny. Like he wants what's, like it's a gracious God, a trustworthy, a truthful God, and yet we have a hard time because there's a lie that has kind of been inside of our bloodstream since the time of Eden. Remember Adam and Eve? Like what was their issue with God? Like after a while, there was like, does God really know what's best for us? He said we shouldn't eat from this fruit. Does he really know what's best for us? Like maybe, what, what, what if we miss out if we obey God? Like we're missing out on this fruit. We got everything else, but we're missing out. Like, you know, and, and that's, that's a question that many of us, we struggle with. That's at the heart of all the problems in this world is this question of what if God is wrong? What, what, if, what if God doesn't know what's good for us? What if we lose when we surrender? What Mary is showing us is... When you surrender to God, you win. When you surrender, you win. You don't lose, you win. If she would have said, I'm not going to surrender to this, I'm not going to say yes to this because I will miss out, ironically, she would have missed out. See where I'm going? She would have missed out on the greatest blessing of her life to be the earthly mother of the Son of God But because she said yes to this, we're still talking about her today. Isn't that beautiful? Now, the second thing, I need to hurry up. The second thing is joy is shared in community. Joy is shared in community. But you got to have the right community, okay? The angel, what he said in the following verses, he said to Mary that there is a cousin that she has. Her name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth, she was already quite old. And she was pregnant too, another miracle baby, because Elizabeth was already way beyond childbearing age. But she also got pregnant with a miracle child. And then verse 39 following, we read that Mary packs up her stuff and she goes down to Judea to visit Elizabeth and her husband, Zechariah. And it says when she entered the house... Uh, in, in, in Elizabeth's house, it said that the, the baby in the womb of Elizabeth was jumping for joy when she just heard Mary's voice. And it says Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she just started to encourage Mary. And she was like, girl, you are blessed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they talk like this, but uh, <laughs> you look at you, boo, you are so pregnant too. Like, I don't know, you know, but she basically said, like, I'm so excited for you. There's favor on you, Mary. I don't even know. I need to remind you. God, God is blessing you. How honored am I that you come to visit me, she says. And she says, God has blessed you 
because you chose to trust what he says. I, I hope that can be said of us as a church. That we're blessed because we choose to trust what he says. Um, when God is doing something in your life, who you call first is really significant. I have a friend, uh, he and his wife got pregnant for the first time. And they decided to, the, to do the first call to his mother-in-law, her mother. And they called her, like, hey, guess what? You're going to be a grandmother. And the response was, are you crazy? <laughs> you're not ready to have no kids yet. Like, you're, you're crazy. Well, I can't believe you. And she started to, like, give him all the reasons why this is a foolish idea. And they went from being really excited about their baby to be really confused and overwhelmed and irritated. Who you call first is really important because that person can decide whether you will experience a moment of joy or a moment of confusion. I want to ask you, do you have some friends in your life, in your small group, in this church, or wherever, some friends in your life where you know if I call them first, they know what it means to encourage me? Yeah? You got someone? That's awesome. Well, you need some friends and people in your circle who can recognize the hand of God in your life and tell you about it, because sometimes we don't see it. You need some people who can speak joy into your life, right? You need some people that you can call and you say, hey, you won't believe what happened. And when they hear that, they're not skeptical, they're not shocked, they're not jealous, but they're excited for you and they rejoice with you. You got some people in your life like that? Um, Mary and Elizabeth just picture that. They, I think they had a great time. They're, they're both like one very, really young, one really old, but they, they both had these, these babies in their wombs and they were excited about um, starting families. Um, and, and they just encouraged each other. And, and I mean, Zechariah was there as well. That's Elizabeth's husband. Poor Zechariah. Think about him. Two pregnant women in his house. And also God sealed his lips and he couldn't speak for the time being before his son was born. So just think about it. This is funny. This is, this is humor in the Bible. Like, you know, where Elizabeth went like, you know, because Mary, maybe she just came for the weekend. And then maybe after a while, Elizabeth said to her husband, hey, husband, do you mind if she stays for a few months? Did you hear him say, no, I, don't, I didn't hear her, no. I guess he's all right with it. Like, and he's like, mm, 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 two, two pregnant women. Like, it's funny. I'm just messing. I'm just messing. I'm just playing. Um, I think all three of them had an amazing time. I think all three of them, Zechariah was a godly man. I think he knew also what it meant um, to rejoice and to build anticipation. He knew for Freude as well as he was processing what's happened. We don't have time for him today. But yeah, uh, Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary sharing some wonderful moments together. Just picture this. Have you noticed that life is a series of moments? Notice this? Hopefully, lots of wonderful moments. They actually bring us joy. Uh, every, every now and then, you have a moment where you want to kind of, in your mind, you want to take a mental picture of that moment. It's like, oh, this is a great moment. And I never will forget this. I have several of those. My wedding is one of those. The birth of my kids. Like, wow, this is amazing. Like, what a moment right now. I don't know, traveling to really cool places, meeting people, like that's a mental picture. I have lots of pictures even from our time here in this church, like several of them. Even a few weeks ago when we had our nine months anniversary and you and some others, you go all dancing up feels like, wow, what's happening? That's quite a moment, right? There's a verse in the Christmas story now in Luke chapter 2, after Jesus was born, after the angels, after the shepherds, once kind of everybody goes back on their way, and it's basically just Mary and Joseph and the child still in that ma at that manger. And it says Mary, in verse 19, it says, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I often overlook that verse, but I think Mary in that moment, she was like, wow, what a moment right now. What a moment. I don't ever want to forget this moment. I um, was at a, at a gathering with other pastors, and there was, there was a pastor, he was wearing a a Christian t-shirt. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with Christian t-shirts. Some of them are good, most of them not so much. But this one, I'll just tell you, you can decide for yourself. It said, um, no Jesus, it's like K-W-O-Y, K-N-W-O, whatever, K-N-O-W, I don't even know how to spell. Okay, so, all right, let me start again. So it says, no Jesus, K-N-O-W, no Jesus, no joy. And then below is, no Jesus, no joy, 
Okay, make sense? So no Jesus, no joy. No Jesus, no joy. It sounds cute, I guess. It's not true though. It's not true. There's lots of things you can enjoy in life without Jesus. Like Christmas cookies taste good whether you're a person of prayer or not. Like they just taste good, right? <laughs> The, the thing is, <laughs> there's lots of things you can enjoy. What is true is, whatever you, your joy is, uh, whatever your joy is sourced by, determines how long it will last. Whatever your joy is sourced by, determines how long it will last. And most people around us, and most people in this room as well, we're trying to source our joy from things that only have a limited supply. The, the latest gadget, I need a new phone. Like, that's fun for a season until the next phone is released. It's like, I need that phone, <laughs> yeah? Or traveling places, that's an amazing thing for that season, for that moment, right? Hanging out with some friends until those friends move away, and then that's over. And, like, lots of things. Entertainment, social media as well. Like, oh, someone liked my story. Oh, my story is gone again. Like, you know, this, this, all of these have a limited supply. Food is like that as well. <laughs> Food makes you happy. Like, I'm always happy when the waiter comes with my food. I hate it when he comes and then he goes to the table next to us. I have the, the thoughts in my head suddenly. Like, I thought I'm a pastor. Like, where are they? Anyways, but, uh, like, I love when he comes with food, but then I always get sad when food comes to an end on my plate. It's like, oh, it's over already. I could still eat some more of this dish. You know, everything's sort of limited. Like, all of these things, guys, seriously, all of these, like, possessions, pleasure, a position, other people, all of these things are fun for the moment, moment, until the moment is over. So yes, it's true that moments can make us happy, but would you write this down? Even the happiest moments eventually become distant memories. Even the happiest moments eventually become distant memories. That's why nostalgia is so painful because in nostalgia um, you remember the joys of the past and you're excited that you still have that memory at the same time you feel almost a sense of loss or you're grieving that that feeling is no longer or that moment is no longer accessible see where I'm going now for us as Christians Lasting joy, lasting joy, not limited joy, lasting joy is not found in moments or in memories, but in a person who has made himself accessible to us, and not just for a moment. The third thing you can write down is joy is found in the manger. Joy is found in the manger. Who's in the manger? Jesus. And here's how Isaac Watts describes it. Joy to the world. Why? Because the Lord is come. Here he is. Let every heart prepare him room. You got room for Jesus in your heart? Let's think about it. You got room for Jesus in your heart to fill you with joy? Um, Christmas time is a time where we eat a lot, at least in our family. Most of us probably do that. And you have to be strategic to leave room, not in your heart, in your belly, for the good stuff. Like, let every, let every stomach prepare this food, some room. Like, come on. I don't know. <laughs> like, you want to make, you got to be strategic. Because the worst thing is when you're already full and then they bring some, something else. Like, oh, I wish I would have known. I would have left some space. Like, oh, you know. And my mom, when I was younger, my mom used to say to me, don't eat chocolate before the meal. You will ruin your appetite. And who has a mom who said this to you? Some of you don't eat. It's true, actually. When you eat chocolate before a meal, chocolate gives your body a bit of a sugar buzz that masks the fact and tricks your body to think that you've already have eaten, even though your body still needs some proper nutrients, some proper food. Okay, so that's what sugar is. Now, here's where I'm going with this. All of these things we talked about that give us a, 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 like a moment, the possessions, the, the, the pleasures, the people, all of these things... They are spiritual sugar for our hearts. They are spiritual sugars. They, they actually can give us a moment of joy, but afterwards we're, le we're, we're still hungry, right? But it's, it's like it's masking the fact that it's like, oh, this is, this is like when my heart is full with all of these things now, and they give you happiness, but they don't nourish you with joy. 
I want to say to you, don't fill your heart with cheap sugar when God had prepared a, prepared a feast for you. A feast for you. Don't be satisfied with the cheap stuff when there is now Jesus who come for you to give you a joy that you've never known, that you've never tasted before. You find joy, true joy, lasting joy in Jesus who is everlasting, which means the, the joy is unlimited. It's not limited joy, it's lasting joy. The joy is accessible, the joy is nourishing, and nothing can take it away from you. That is what we call, or what the Bible calls, the joy of our salvation. And that's what, that's what we celebrate on Christmas, that the joy of our salvation has come to us in the person of Jesus. Now, I know I said I'm going to give you three things, and I gave you three things, but I have a bonus for you. I'm going to throw that in for free. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, it would be incomplete without this one. Is that joy is expressed in worship. Joy is expressed best in worship. In worship. In Luke chapter 1, if you go back to this, uh, while Mary was still with Elizabeth, she, Mary turns into Mariah Carey, basically, <laughs> and she writes a Christmas, she, she writes a Christmas hit uh, called the Magnificat. Uh, magnify, you know, a magnifying glass, like I'm going to just make God big in my thoughts and in my thinking. And she, see, she starts to sing truth about who God is and what he's done for her. Let me just read some of those verses to you, not the whole thing. You can read it at home. But in Luke chapter 1, verse 46, here's how that song starts that she writes. We don't know the music to it, but we know the lyrics. She sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and so on and so forth. If you want to experience the joy of your salvation, start thinking about who he is and what he's done for you. And then start singing about who he is and what he's done for you. Maybe you're saying, I don't know how to sing. I'm not a very good singer. I'm talking about a song in your heart, not, not your vocal cords, a song in your heart. And there's something that, when you do that, there's something that changes in your perspective. There's something about that that actually causes joy to rise. Like, how many of you, like me, you've been coming to church, and, uh, and all of the problems in your life seemed really big, and God seemed really small? And then as you were singing, as we were singing together, as we looked to Jesus, suddenly, as if things turned around, come on, this is me. I'm speaking from testimony, but I think many of you have experienced this as well. We're suddenly like, okay, God is really big again in my mind. I've magnified him, and these other things become really small, almost insignificant. Is this me? No, come on, some thanks, bro. Yeah, okay. Right? That's, so many times we've, we've experienced that as well, and that's what I believe Isaac Watts is inviting us to when he says, joy to the world. The Lord is come, and heaven and nature sing. Nature, that's, that's us. We're part of that. Heaven is singing. Let's join with what heaven is doing in all nature, and we're going to sing as well. Now, you may say, how, how, how can I start with that? Well, I want to challenge you, invite you, actually, maybe even this afternoon or over the next few days, to sit down um, and start writing down just some things, like what God is to you, quite personally. Not some things that you're like, oh, I know the Bible says. No, what, how have you experienced him? What has he been to you? What has he done for you? Start writing some of these things down. What, what, what's true about him to you? E even now, guys, let's, let's just do a little exercise. What, what, would, be, what would be some things, that, so even a word or a couple of words, that you would uh, put down and put maybe in a song if you could? If you could write a song, like what would be a part of the lyric? But just shout it out. Like what would be a part of the lyric that you would be in there? Faithful, thank you. What else? Grace, great, great word. Patience. Love, very good. Beautiful, provider. What else? It's a good song already. I like it. Huh? Healing, come on. Rescuer, very good. What else? What, what are some of the lyrics like that needs to be in my song, like Mary had her song? Fellowship, sorry? Savior, very good. Comfort. Trust. I heard something else. Frieden, peace. Freedom. Freedom. I like that as well. It's good. Yeah, sorry. Kindness. Hope. 
peace, very good. Right? I tell you, you, you'll find it really hard to sit in these truths and maybe start singing them, even in hmm, your humming, you know, you start singing them and not feel the joy rising up in, in your body. I, I want to actually in, invite you to do something now. We're going to end the service a little bit different now. And uh, I want to teach you a song. I'm going to turn you into a choir. You up for this? Yeah? It's not Mary's song, but it's a similar song. We used to sing this song when I was in youth group, and I had forgotten about it until recently that song had a bit of a uh, comeback, thanks to Kanye West of all people. <laughs> uh, but it's a song that when I sing it, for me personally, I can't sing it and not feel joy rising up. Because it's a song that is uh, basically singing about, it's declaring the goodness of God. And as you declare the goodness of God, oh, <laughs> joy starts to just bubble up. And uh, do we have some piano for us? Because otherwise it'll kind of sound, yes. Thank you. Uh, so the lyrics are quite simple. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Some of you know it. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. The Lord our God, he's mighty. The Lord our God is, <laughs> funny word to sing in the lyric, omnipotent. Nobody said that earlier. Omnipotent means he's all powerful. Yeah, he can do all things. The Lord our God, he's wonderful. Let me show you how it goes. Can you put it on the screen? Oh, where are you? Oh, okay, good. Oh, okay, you got it? So how many of you know it? Some of you know it? It goes like this. Here we go. Mm. Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty, the Lord our God is omnipotent, the Lord our God, He is wonderful. Some of you, some of you knew it already, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Shall we do it again? Hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty, the Lord our God is omnipotent, the Lord our God, He is one. There's a second part, it goes like this. All praises be to the King of kings, for the Lord our God, He is wonderful. One more time. All praises be to the King of kings, and the Lord our God, He is one. Okay, just pause real quick. The third part uh, has the word hallelujah, hallelujah, and then you go hallelujah, 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 like really fast. And if you don't feel joy then, I don't know what's wrong, I can't help you. That. It's just so funny to sing hallelujah so fast. It's just, okay, it goes like this, uh, hallelujah, really high. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. He is wonderful. One more time, because it's funny. Hallelujah. 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 He is wonderful. All right. Very cool. Um, you, you still sound and look a little bit like the people Isaac Watts was talking about. Is everybody seems so bored in church. It's much easier to sing this when you're standing up, people, all right? And um, I believe all the three parts can actually be sung at the same time together, and then it's supposed to sound okay. It worked quite good in the German service, I must say. So the challenge, the, the pressure is on for you guys to also be able to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to start again at the top and then you guys over here, you're going to sing with him the first part, right? Yeah. You guys are singing with Lindy. They're very hallelujah, hallelujah. That's you guys, okay? So go crazy. There's only a few of you here, so you got to sing out loud. And then you guys sing that second part, the all praises be to the King of Kings with Kara. Is that all right? Let's start together. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory, honor. And power to 
For the Lord our God is mighty. The Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. All praise. Hallelujah. 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 Honor and power unto the Lord. All praises be to the King of Kings. Hallelujah. He is one. Let's bring in some music as well. Lift your hands and sing to the joy. Yes. Wonderful, hallelujah, salvation is omnipotent. That's where we are. Can we just have just have you guys? Can we do the all pray? Omnipotent, the Lord. Everyone. Okay. The joy of the Lord is our strength. One more time. All praise. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Honor. Thank <laughs> you.